When you think of FEMA, most people think of hurricanes and tornadoes, but FEMA has also been responding to another emergency, COVID-19. We'll talk about that work and the rest of FEMA's mission with Deanne Criswell, who is the administrator of FEMA. Administrator, welcome to the program. Thank you, Mimi, it's good to be here. So let's start with COVID because and it is an emergency, but it's a public health emergency. Mm -hmm. Had that always been a part of FEMA's mission? Well, I think it's important to look at the word emergency and emergencies come in many shapes and sizes. Uh, it can be natural disasters, which is what we think of often with FEMA, hurricanes, tornadoes, but it can be pandemics. It can be man-made events. It could be cyber events. And so FEMA's role is to make sure that we bring all of the appropriate players together to manage the impacts or the consequences of these emergencies. Emergencies. So tell us about what you've been doing in response to COVID. Yeah, so, you know, as we talk about responding and um, coordinating and bringing all the people together, our role since day one has been to support the lead federal agency, the lead public health agency in this, which has been HHS and their components. Um, and our role has evolved throughout the last two years um, as the virus itself has continued to evolve. Um, the type of service and the resources that we've been providing have continued to expand expand um, to support the, the ongoing needs, right? And so it started with testing, it moved into vaccines, um, supporting the expansion of the healthcare system, bringing resources and PPE into jurisdictions. And so uh, we continue to just uh, make sure we understand what the current need is and the current threat is and make sure we get the right resources to support that. And how long has that been going on? How quickly did you ramp up to respond to COVID? So this started before I was in this position, um, but FEMA certainly started even before the public health uh, emergency was declared by having conversations with our partners at HHS to understand the scope of what they were going to do and where FEMA might be able to or might need to get involved to help coordinate and bring the necessary resources to this. So right from day one. And how does it actually work? Do you deploy people? Are there FEMA employees that are spread out around the country giving mm -hmm. vaccines? Uh, so it's a little bit of um, both, right? So it's our people that go out and they support the coordination. Um, we mission assign our federal partners. That's one of the key ways that we provide assistance. And we have mission assigned the Department of Defense. We have mission assigned um, Army Corps of Engineers. But what does that mean, mission assigned? Mission assigned is when we give an order to another federal agency to go support the disaster. And so when there's a major disaster declaration that's been declared by the president, and for COVID-19, that has all 50 states and territories and some of our tribes have a major disaster declaration. And so that gives us the authority and the ability to mission assign or task another federal agency to support whatever the response needs are. Um, so Department of Defense, they've been providing medical providers in hospitals. Um, we've been deploying the Army Corps of Engineers early on. They were building hospitals and alternate care sites in the first few days of this. Um, but we also have contracts. And so we bring in contracts to support other things like some of the vaccine missions that we support have been funded by contracts um, and then um, we have our own staff that continue to go out and support the coordination and integrate really closely with our state and uh, local partners because what we need to know is what their needs are right we need to understand on the ground so we can give them the right resources you're also offering funeral assistance to the families of victims of covid that, that was interesting to me. I didn't, I didn't know that FEMA does that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very unfortunate, right? We've got now over 900,000 individuals that have lost their lives to COVID-19. And funeral assistance is one of the programs that we have available during major disaster declarations. Um, but for this, it was on a scale that we have never done before. And so we had to put new mechanisms in place to make sure that we could manage the number of people that were going to be asking for this assistance. And it's really been just another tool that we have to help these families um, deal with their loss and help with their uh, recovery. And have people been availing themselves of that, that support? Uh, absolutely. I think the last numbers I saw were about half of the uh, um, total number of people that have lost their lives have applied for assistance, for funeral assistance, to help with those costs. Well, give us an idea of the process. So when there's an emergency, is it the, the president that makes the declaration? Is it a governor or at the local level? Yeah. How does that work? That's a great question. Uh, so it all starts at the local level. Uh, disasters start and end with that local jurisdiction. I was a local emergency manager um, before this. And so when the needs of my community or of that local emergency manager's community 
um, exceed their capacity, then they'll go to the state and they'll ask for assistance. Um, and then when the needs of the state, when it exceeds their capacity, then the state and the governor can ask for a presidential declaration. Uh, there's two types. They can ask for an emergency declaration, which provides some immediate relief to help with their response efforts, or it can be a major disaster declaration, which helps with their ongoing rebuilding and recovery from that disaster. And so the governor makes the request to the president through FEMA, um, and then we send up our recommendation to the president, and then the president makes the final determination. And at that point, that's when you start to mobilize. We or can you mobilize before yeah, that? Yeah, we don't have to wait. And so one of okay. the things that PCEMRA, the Post-Katrina Emergency Reform Act, gave us is the ability to send resources in early. And so we can deploy and stage resources as soon as we think that there's going to be a potential need. Uh, that's all on the government's dime. Um, but we don't deploy or employ them, right? We don't put them to work until after the declaration. Can you give us an idea of some of the areas that you're working, uh, that FEMA is working on around the country? Yeah, absolutely. It was a busy year in uh, 2021, and there are a number of open uh, joint field offices that we currently have helping to support the stabilization of those incidents. Uh, for example, we had uh, flash flooding in Tennessee that really took out um, a small town there. Uh, we had Hurricane Ida that uh, was hit Louisiana, stayed a Category 4 hurricane for nearly four hours on the ground, and then made its way all the way to New York City and New Jersey and caused damage. And so we've got staff in both of those areas uh, helping with that. We recently had the tornadoes in Kentucky. We had fires in Colorado, and we had a number of wildfires in the West this year. And so those are some of the open disasters that we have staff working on right now of things that just happened in 2021. You'd mentioned this before, which is your role of coordination. So you coordinate with local um, the people on the ground, uh, faith-based organizations, nonprofits, yeah. state. That's a lot of coordination going on. What what would you say is the key to effective coordination with all those different players in the middle of a disaster? The key is making sure that we have those relationships ahead of time. And we do that through all of our preparedness efforts. Um, we have 10 regions um, and our regional in, uh, administrators are instrumental in this process, right? They build the relationships with their state and local partners within their region, with the nonprofit agencies that are within their region. They're really our uh, first entry into the FEMA system and making sure that they are connecting with all of the people within their region to help them prepare, but also to help them with their mitigation plans um, so they can reduce the impact that we're seeing. The national level, we do the same thing. We have national level exercises, we have training that brings together all of the appropriate um, stakeholders, whether it's our federal partners, our state partners, private sector, nonprofit. That's where we get together to make sure that we know how we're gonna work together. Um, so when we do have to respond, it's seamless. And of course, you're responding in the middle of a pandemic, yes. which makes everything more complicated. It does. I mean, it certainly has added a whole level of challenge on there, mostly because we want to make sure that one, we are taking care of our staff and ensuring for their safety, their health and safety, um, but also the communities, right? They're also very vulnerable because of the disaster, but even more so than when you add COVID-19 on top of that. And so making sure that we're putting everything that we can in place to help those communities stay safe and start their recovery. So how would you measure success um, after a disaster? Is it by the number of people that you were able to get into housing? Is it the amount of meals that you gave out? Like, how do you how do you measure how well you did? You know, we have a tendency to look at numbers like that, but I think that we have to put those numbers in context. Um, it can't be just numbers because we don't know how big the impact was to the community. And so for me, it's when I talk to the governor and the governor says, I'm happy with where we're going. I appreciate the work that you're doing and things are, are starting to move on the road to recovery. We want to use those types of metrics that you mentioned as a way to help guide what we're doing, but we have to make sure we're putting in context and then setting benchmarks for us, right? And where do we want to go? Because every community is going to have different needs. So it's one thing to prepare for expected disasters and emergencies. How do you prepare for the unforeseen, the unexpected? I think that's the challenge that we are facing today. Uh, some of the things that I have talked about with our emergency managers around the country is 
we have a tendency to do all of our planning, our exercises based on historical risk. Um, and it's easy, it's easier I should say, um, because we have the data, we know what's happening. But as we start to see the impacts that we're seeing from climate change, the disasters that are happening at times that we don't expect them, we have to start planning for the future risks and learning how to better model what we think might come so we can be better prepared. That's just on the natural disaster side. You know, I think as we manage consequences from any disaster, everything that we do really helps with those unknown events too. Um, so we can, again, building those relationships and that collaboration network so we can respond quickly. Well, speaking of climate change, uh, you know, weather disasters are gonna keep getting worse. Um, and you wrote this quote, 10 years ago, we managed an average of 108 disasters a year. Today, we're managing 311 including the ongoing response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, that's three times, that's a big yeah. increase. It is, and what we're seeing when we talk about that many disasters that we're managing, that doesn't mean that we have open field offices in all of the states, but it means that we have recovery operations that are still ongoing. And so most of that work is being done at our regional offices. And what that tells me is that these disasters are more significant, creating longer, more complicated recoveries, which means that these disasters are staying open longer for us to make sure that we're rebuilding in a way that's helping them become more resilient. Are, have you been able to scale up to meet that increased demand? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, we have different levels of our staffing that help support disasters. One of the primary resources that we have and, and so valuable is our reservist workforce. Uh, more than half of our workforce is made up of reservists and they are the foundation for the response that we have going out to disasters. Uh, they are the ones that deploy and get the operation up and running and stay there throughout the disaster. But as we have multiple disasters maybe happening at the same time, we saw this in 2000 2017 with Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria. Uh, we bring in our full-time staff from headquarters or the regional offices to help augment some of that. We have what are called core employees, cadre of on-call reservist employees that go in and support that. But we also have um, the Department of Homeland, Secu Homeland Security uh, surge capacity force where we can bring in members from the department, other departments that have volunteered and signed up, and they actually come out and help us. And so we have all of these different layers to help us surge for the immediate response, help stabilize that incident and then return to our normal mechanisms to manage the recovery. Is there a role for FEMA to play in climate resilience um, or will you just be preparing for the after effects? I think it's both there, right? I think we certainly have a role to play in helping to lead our emergency management profession in better understanding what climate resilience means. And so that way they can make better decisions, risk-informed decisions on how they can reduce the impacts that we're seeing from climate change um, so that our responses and our recovery efforts, as we talked previously, aren't as complicated as we're recovering from um, these storms that these uh, jurisdictions are experiencing. So what are you doing in that specific field of climate resiliency? One of the things that I am really excited about is uh, we have what's called a national level exercise and it happens every two years and going into 2024, our national level exercise is gonna be about climate resilience. And so we're gonna do a series of webinars, um, uh, tabletop exercises, educational sessions with our emergency management community to help them better understand what it, they, what steps they can take and what climate resilience means, help us understand the different language around it so we're all on the same page. I think it's gonna be such an important campaign to help increase the capacity of emergency managers across the nation so we can become more resilient to the, the impacts that we're seeing from climate. Equity in government services mm -hmm. is a big priority for the White House. Yes. Um, what are you doing at FEMA to ensure that everybody gets FEMA services equitably? Equity is so important. It has always been important. Um, and for me, uh, one, we put it right up front in our strategic plan. So we just released our strategic plan and ensuring equity in the delivery of our programs is gonna be a critical component of how we move forward as an agency. Um, things like remembering that a one-size-fits-all approach to the delivery of our programs doesn't work. Uh, every community has different needs. They have different um, constraints. Uh, we see that the, the disasters that we're seeing, the natural disasters, 
disproportionately impact some of our more impoverished communities. And so we have to make sure that we are always putting people first, first and forefront um, to understand what their needs are, but more importantly, understand what their barriers are to accessing our programs. If we can understand their barriers, then we can work to remove those and then we'll have equitable delivery of our programs. You know, it's also your goal um, for the FEMA workforce to reflect the diversity of the country. Absolutely. How far away from that goal are you and what are you doing to address that? You know, it's been a goal that the agency has had forever, right? We need to be able to represent the communities that we serve so we better understand um, their needs. And we have a ways to go. Uh, we're getting there. We're increasing the diversity um, in our leadership team, which I'm really proud of um, with, uh, I think, one of the most diverse leadership teams that FEMA has ever had. Um, but it needs to be the start, right? That's not the end. Setting that example at the top now means we need to drive that down and continue to recruit a diverse workforce um, and help them get through the system and into our, our operations so they can um, help their communities. You know, before becoming administrator, you served as commissioner of the New York City Emergency Management Department, and this was during the worst phase of the pandemic for that city. What were you responsible for? What was your experience? Yeah, that was uh, the very beginning of COVID-19. Um, and I remember my first phone call with the commissioner um, of the Department of Public Health and Environment there of like, what do you think this is going to be? And, you know, from that first phone call to, you know, where we are today, it has ebbed and flowed throughout this pandemic. Um, it was challenging. Uh, my role, um, as emergency managers do, was to lead the coordination of all the different city agencies that had a piece to play. And we were doing things like making sure no New Yorker went hungry. Um, we had one of the largest mass fatality missions in um, our nation's history, um, preventing the, the collapse of the healthcare sy system. And, you know, as we talk about from FEMA mission assigning the Department of Defense, it was us then, how do we apply those resources to make sure that our hospitals can continue to operate? One of the most challenging times in my entire career, without a doubt, um, but one that has made me a stronger emergency manager um, and lessons that I hope to bring to FEMA as we continue to increase our ability to respond to other disasters. Well, you're the first uh, woman to serve as FEMA administrator. What does that mean to you personally? Oh, you know, I think um, for me, I'm, I'm really proud of my background as an emergency manager, but I think the biggest thing is being the first female in this role is um, letting other women know that they have something that they can aspire to, right? And, and being able to see somebody that looks like them makes a big difference. And I'll share with you a, a comment that one of our employees made when I first got there. And she had said, um, when I first joined FEMA a year ago, there were zero women in my chain of command between me and the President of the United States, and today there's five. That was really significant for her. And so I think having, again, this diverse workforce and, and representation of what can be is really important for our, our workforce so they can see and model um, where they want to go. Well, finally, what are you most proud of, of the work that FEMA has done while you were administrator? Uh, you know, when I first came in, um, our workforce is amazing. And uh, their continued compassion and commitment to our mission and helping people um, is, is amazing. And I think it's one of the best um, examples of the workforce in the federal government. But I think the thing that has been really exciting and I'm most proud of what they accomplished was when I first came in, the president had asked us to deliver 100 million vaccine doses in 100 days. Um, that was shortly after he took office and our team blew it out of the water. They delivered 200 million vaccines in 100 days to help increase um, the protection for our communities. Well, wow. well, thank you for your work, Administrator. Thank you for coming in. So nice Thanks to talk to you. This was great. Thank you. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.